Hi, everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay? Okay. Uh, welcome to, uh, to panel two. And this will be a different panel um, uh, than the other, not only in topic, but in, but in style. Perhaps because most of us are uh, a bit older, uh, we decide not to have presentations. So you'll probably learn a lot less in terms of facts. But on the other hand, we're going to be involved in some questions, answers, debates, and um, definitely leave a lot more time for everyone out there to participate, share their views, and ask uh, all of us uh, questions. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's begin. Find my notes. Let me put on the table before I throw out questions to the panel some of some background and some factoids on the general, more specific topic of um, rule of law in the present context of Argentina. First, there's the international dimension of this. This obviously has gotten a great deal of press attention, including, of course, um, press attention related to the famous Parapasu case, NML versus Argentina, with many other plaintiffs, including uh, some hold retail holders of bonds. Um, they put that in some context. Going back to Argentina's default at the end of 2001. <clears throat> it's useful to remember where we are because the mythology in Argentina today is this was the most successful debt exchange in history. The mythology is they successfully negotiated with 93% of their creditors. <coughs> well, let's take, so let's take a little bit of perspective. First, as something of a scholar in this field and reading uh, scholarly reports on it, including from uh, the IMF, Argentina's approach beginning uh, with the um, inauguration of um, President Kirchner was no negotiations, unilateral, arbitrarily what Argentina decided. <coughs> to the point at which they literally divorced relations in 2004 with the IMF because the IMF and the rest of the international community was insisting on conventional approaches, negotiations, minimum participation thresholds, all the technical features which have made debt restructurings um, work in most cases. So Argentina's approach was, you know, was unprecedented. Their commitment, both legally and in the bond documentation, to never pay holdouts anything, similarly unprecedented. What are the results of this? Two stand out. One, in 2005, the participation rate was lower, at something like just under 75%, was lower than any single sovereign bond exchange on record. Everyone else got 90 and above. Discounting the participation of Argentine institutions under the influence of the authorities, participation by others who are truly free to choose was only about 60%, even more of a record low. Following bond restructurings, even in cases where participation is not 100%, and it rarely is. Argentina is the only country which has had to face litigation regarding the results of its debt exchange. Let me repeat that, the only country. There have been something like 15, 16 countries which have now, in the past 15 years, restructured external law foreign bonds. Only one has had a single lawsuit against it. Unique. Refusal to honor judgments in the context of um, 
recent years, I don't know of any cases where a country just simply refuses. Sim certainly not when it, it, can it cannot be demonstrated that it's not affordable. We're not talking about low-income African countries. Here, we're talking about one of the uh, wealthiest uh, middle-income countries in the world. And, of course, everyone knows about the refusal to, uh, to follow the Parapasu ruling, injunction, which has been affirmed several times by a circuit court, and the Supreme Court re refused to review it. That's the external record, just on the debt. But there's more to the external record. Following the um, default in 2002 and for a number of years, as one of the speakers before demonstrated, privatization was largely reversed to a very considerable extent, particularly against companies, large Argentine companies, which had been bought by foreigners. This resulted literally in hundreds, not just the nationalizations, the failure to live up to the contracts, ha having to do with tariffs and things like that, hundreds of cases brought against Argentina in various arbitration form, including the uh, ICSID, the uh, World Bank's arbitration. Every single one of these was fought tooth and nail. The majority of the awards were and have not been paid. There have been a recent settlement of some of the exits, but not all of the exits. There was a case this spring where the Supreme Court ruled that an arbitration in favor of British gas against Argentina that still hasn't been paid. It's a record of fight to the nail, and if you lose, refuse. And of course, most recently, we see a ruling against Argentina by the World Trade Association in favor of Europe and the United States and essentially public commitments by uh, the Argentine government to first fight and then never accept. There's a pattern there. And I would uh, submit a rather unique one. On the internal side, let me have two more minutes on that. It's not just external, but it's domestic as well. And let me just point out three results <coughs> from the World Bank's uh, database on, uh, on governance and compare Argentina with the other members of the G20, including the other 10 emerging market members of the G20, on corruption. Argentina is third from the bottom, ahead only of Indonesia and Russia at the very bottom. In terms of the quality, stability, reliability of the regulatory regime, Argentina's last. That's an important aspect of governance and rule of law, in my view. And finally, in the more narrow sense of rule of law, Argentina is among the G20 countries, second to last, only Russia is a bit below. These are World Bank data. That's the situation, and now I want to turn to the panel to ask some questions to enlighten us about, is this the right picture? What brought it about? What are the implications? What might be done about it? And so we'll start this and continue for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll turn it over to you to uh, give your views and to press, and to press us. Uh, first of all, um, What's the panel think? Was I exaggerating and being unfair to Argentina? Or are they not only rife with question marks about rule of law broadly defined, but rather unique among their peer group? Richard? I can't disagree with anything you said. Obviously, they do have a record of repeated defaults over the last two centuries. and. It's not surprising for that reason that Argentina has not had access to uh, world capital markets in a long time. And I think it's kind of humorous the way that they're trying to go about trying to uh, claim that, 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 that they really are serious about reestablishing credibility. They are going out of their way to say that, well, we really want to make some payments on a portion of our exchange bonds. 
And of course, the way they're doing it is they're trying to make payments by uh, purposely evading court orders that have been entered against them. And I think that if you want to uh, uh, have confidence in your stability uh, increased in the countries around the world, the last way to do it is to uh, avoid the court judgments of uh, uh, major financial markets. Now, you, if you're in Argentina, you may disagree with the decision that was entered against you. Uh, but in the long run, if you don't obey court orders, yes, you have the right to refuse because no American court can seize your assets and force you to pay, but nobody's going to trust you in the future. Anyone else want to add to that? Otto? Yeah, I'd like to add. Uh, first of all, I'm not an expert on defaults, except my own uh, personal ones. That's something to me and my false bank. False or defaults? <laughs> <laughs> false, no false, just defaults. Um, but uh, my background is, is in um, U.S. government and, and uh, foreign policy, and I happened to be uh, actually Assistant Secretary of State for the Western Hemisphere when this, uh, the 2001-2002 crisis happened. Uh, and I think there's a lot, there are a lot of aspects of what happened then that, um, you know, people have either forgotten or, or not known about. I think one of the, one of the important things uh, about what is happening today, and you're absolutely right to go back to this myth that uh, some people in Argentina seem to have that they handled that correctly. Um, they they obviously did not. What worries me is that a lot of other countries are watching what is happening, um, and from a political standpoint. A lot of people may not have paid attention, for example, to the fact that very recently, a few weeks ago, after uh, one of the, after the Supreme U.S. Supreme Court uh, judgment that came down um, say against Argentina, the uh, the Argentines called a special session of the uh, Organization of American States to bring this case to, in effect, the the regional political body of the Western Hemisphere, uh, and they uh, presented their case and asked for a vote. Who supports Argentina? Uh, who supports the United States? And of course, they won the vote 33 to 2. The only two, uh, I believe that was the vote, 33 to 2, 31 to 2. I don't remember exactly. Uh, frankly, uh, even though I follow it, like most people who know the OAS, I don't follow it. Uh, too closely for my own health. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what the vote was, it was overwhelming. All the Latin American and Caribbean countries supported Argentina. Supported it in what? I don't know. I mean, it, you could say it was a free vote because it meant absolutely nothing like most OAS votes. Uh, but it does signal to the, the rest of the hemisphere that there's, quote, political support, which is what the Argentines wanted. Political support for this. Uh, disregard of their international obligations. And all it does is just it creates more friction between the United States and uh, some of the other countries in, in Latin America, not all of whom support Argentina, and much less do they emulate Argentina uh, in its behavior. But it does cause um, a lot of problems on the political side. All right. They've sort of follow up on that. Obviously, uh, Argentina has made a lot of noise. OAS, the UN, uh, what's it, the G80 plus China, whatever it's called, um, support wherever they can under sort of justice and fairness versus just a court judgment. Um, I sort of call this the Hebrew National Defense. There used to be a television ad, Hebrew National Hot Dogs, um, and it boils down to the government has its standards, but we have to answer to a higher standard, the kosher hot dog. Well, here it's as if the Argentines say, well, we answer to our own standards. We appeal to the Pope. Um, et cetera, et cetera. 
Ambassador, are there other countries which typically, when it comes to international law issues and, and Richard, all three of you, which so typically invoke the Hebrew national defense? Well, I'll, 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 I'll cede my uh, place. Uh, well, uh, I have less experience, or my experience in this area goes not as far back as some other um, panelists, um, I, I suspect. But uh, in my roughly 15 years, um, as a litigation counsel um, involved in sovereign default matters. Um, I've not seen um, another country um, as willing or as skilled at invoking what you call the Hebrew national defense as Argentina has been. I mean, what I find most remarkable, ironic, and frankly infuriating all at the, infuriating all at the same time about that is um, – you know, as we all know, I mean, it's, it's, it, um, almost doesn't need to be said. You know, like when um, Argentina <clears throat> looks to borrow money, you know, they are um, in, invoking the higher power of the U.S. in the foreign capital markets, and they do so by, or they have done so by, consenting to be to litigate disputes in the courts of the United States and. Um, implicitly to abide by the uh, decisions of, uh, of those courts. And it's only where um, abiding by those decisions uh, doesn't serve the political um, objectives of the administration that suddenly um, we see other higher powers invoked. Um, but again, it's, it's an obvious point. Um, the, the, in answer to your question, I, I, I don't think that there has been a precedent of another country that's been so willing to, to go to that as Argentina. Otto, you've been an ambassador in a variety of places and sitting in the assistant secretary chair. You saw a lot of stuff. Are there other countries which behave this way? Even, uh, you know, how does this compare with, I don't know, Ecuador, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia? Right. Well, I mean, uh, actually, I was ambassador to Venezuela, so I'm not sure that I should use that experience as a, a platform. Uh, but when I was ambassador to Venezuela, actually, it, it paid its debts, uh, and it was doing pretty well. Uh, the, one of the things that does concern me about the Argentine example, and, uh, it doesn't look like they're, quote, going to get away with it, uh, is that there's a lot of other countries that have defaulted, uh, Ecuador, for example, uh, in, but they're, you know, they're, they try to restructure their debt uh, and pay uh, according to the rules. Um, but I think that if, if uh, Argentina were to not be uh, brought to its obligations, um, it would serve as a, a bad example for many other countries. And from what I understand, this particular debt is payable by Argentina. It has the resources to pay. Uh, the, in in, in um, just preparing for this panel, I was reading uh, one article that – I read more than one article, but one particular article said that this uh, – the amount owed to the uh, noncompliant uh, bondholders is – I think it's like 1% of what um, – 1% – it's perfect – Argentina is perfectly capable of paying this. So they – I think what they're trying to do, perhaps politically, I don't know, perhaps because, you know, it was Christina Kirchner's husband who was involved, uh, late husband, in the decision to, to default and to, you know, bring about that, that great uh, – uh, success that you talked to, you described earlier, as they, as they see it as, uh, that they just don't want to do it. But the question is, if they can do it, why are they not, you know, just paying the the uh, the seven percent of that uh, debt? They paid. They came to an agreement with ninety three percent of the bondholders. Uh, they got quite a haircut. Um, I don't know whether they might think that that's going to make it harder for them in the future. If I could just expand on just the point that Otto made. Um, now, we know that Argentina has the means to satisfy that 7 percent because, um, you know, their reported um, 
foreign currency reserves held through BCRA, which we've now seen, I think we're in our seventh or eighth year of <clears throat> the state um, robbing the kitty of the reserves to satisfy debt obligations to, um, to creditors that it wants to service. There's more than enough um, in the, those um, foreign currency reserves to satisfy that 7%. And even if that weren't true, um, if Argentina were to actually sit down, negotiate with creditors and work out a deal, which I'm confident would happen quickly if it were serious about negotiating, they would once again be able to re-access the foreign capital markets. And if there were any shortfall in the reserves, they ought to be able to fill that shortfall uh, um, through um, fresh, money that they, fr fresh money that they access through the capital market. So, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about that, Otto. Chairman's intervention. Um, I would not agree that they, re they reached an agreement with 93%. They put a shotgun to everyone's head, and 93% in two parts. First, first roughly 75%, or my 60% of those who were voluntary, and then with two-thirds in 2010. There was nothing. They didn't reach an agreement. It was like a shotgun wedding. Um, the other thing is, just to put a little perspective here, could they cut a check for one and a half, one eight billion dollars? I'm sure they could, but these plaintiffs hold a relatively small percentage of all of the unrestructured debt. Those people, in my view, and probably legally, are also entitled to recompense, probably 100% of their claims. So if one takes the view that whatever these plaintiffs would be paid would have to be paid sooner or later to the others, then it's a much bigger number. Call it 15, 20. It's, not a, it's in that range 15. of claims. Of claims. You, maybe you can prove it. I'm not so sure. 1520 in total claims. Doesn't make any difference to the point. 15 is a very large number compared with their reserves, particularly their reserves. That's what's on the asset side of the central bank's balance sheet. They have debits on the other side. The net reserves are probably more on the order of three, four, five billion dollars. China's, on the other hand, is all on the asset side and very little on the Deficit. So it's not easy to pay 15, 10, 15, 20, whatever. Ultimately, but you're right, in my view, it has to go into negotiations and come up with something perhaps similar to what I did with the Paris Club. They rescheduled without any loss of value. Um, and so the, the, I want to lead to this. What's preventing negotiations from happening? Why aren't they negotiating? What's Richard, what's your view on that? Well, I think politically it's a, a very attractive position to blame the problems on uh, imperialism in, in the United States and Great Britain instead of, of, uh, uh, of entering into serious negotiations. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that it took nine years for Argentina to even say that it was uh, willing to uh, consider negotiating. It clearly, I, I mean, no holdout really wants to go through a nine-year court battle to get where NML and other uh, creditors have gotten to. Uh, there could have been negotiations years ago for uh, a, a much smaller figure. The same goes for all the people who don't, who maybe have judgments but don't have an injunction and therefore are not in the same position as NML. Yes, nominally those debts are in excess of $10 billion, but if they could avoid all litigation, I'm sure that they would agree to a negotiated settlement that it's a much better deal. But, uh, but I think more than anything else, it comes down to uh, uh, a political decision that it is better to play to home audiences and uh, and pick a, a position oneself as the uh, the opponent of of uh, uh, foreign oppressors rather than to be seriously interested in reopening access to credit markets which presumably is 
what Argentina needs to grow its economy. Yeah, can I just add something that Please. I, just to, to, to support that. Um, things are not going well economically for Christina, as we saw in the, uh, particularly in Juan Carlos Hidalgo's presentation, uh, across the board. And uh, this confrontation has, as he also mentioned, increased her popularity. Uh, actually, the other, some of the other panelists mentioned. Uh, so it had served a political purpose. Uh, and th th this is not unique to Christina Kirchner. I mean, it's the, uh, when the uh, uh, Argentine generals were in office in the early 80s and things were going very badly economically, they uh, all of a sudden remembered that uh, the Falkland Islands were Argentine territory. They decided to invade at that moment. Uh, and what happened, you know, enormous popular support for the uh, dictatorship until they lost, of course, uh, which brought down the dictatorship. Uh, so it's the, the, the use of a foreign devil for purposes of rallying uh, nationalistic support uh, of a government that's having trouble internally is, is very, very old. And I think that, that that's one of the reasons, perhaps, why she's doing this. The first panel um, discussed the notion and the tendency in Argentina to blame others. Um, and that's sort of a repeat of what uh, you people have just been saying. Um, what about the implications of the default and the other mismanagement leading to the populists' populations change in attitudes of nationalism versus uh, their pocketbook over the next year. Could any of this uh, get out of control and either force uh, uh, Christina Kirshner to change or force a change in government? I don't think I don't think it's going to force Christina Kirchner to change. I think she probably feels. And by the way, I think an Argentine is much better qualified than I am to to answer this. But unless my colleagues here are uh, dual citizens, uh, don't think so. None of us are are, are qualified by virtue of uh, passport. Uh, I think she's probably come to the conclusion that she's played her role in history. Uh, I hope she has, because I think for her to stay, which she planned to do, she had planned to run again. Uh, but things, things got so bad, economically particularly, that she um, decided not to. Uh, I don't think that she's going to change. I would hope that the people of Argentina at some point will realize that, that this default is simply just the latest in at least about 100 years of mistakes, to use a, you know, to use a, a mild term, committed by their rulers. 100 years ago, 1913, uh, Argentina had the 10th highest per capita GDP in the world. Uh, it is now 55. By the way, I don't know what the country with the 55th per capita income is doing in the G20, which is supposed to be the Know, the 20 largest, more important, most important economies, but uh, that's a mistake attributable to an administration that I served in, so I will not criticize it. Uh, um, it was frankly because Argentina was helping in the Gulf War, and uh, it was doing a l much better at that time. But in any event, I think that th there's, a, there's a pattern of, of Argentina uh, you know, as I said, in, 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 well, even less than 100 years, since the end of the Second World War, since, since 45, since Perón, um, squandering its incredible wealth. I mean, it has incredible wealth. It's uh, potentially one of the richest countries in the world. And uh, again, 100 years ago, Argentina had the second largest railway network in this continent, second only to the United States. Uh, it was attracting more people than Canada or Australia, more immigrants, for example. Um, and and yet today it it can't or won't yep. pay its debts and it's it's what uh, I don't know if it was Hayek one of the quotes that was put up on the board was absolutely right this is not an economic problem Argentina's problems are not economic they're sociological 
And the people of Argentina have to, at some point, come to grips with the fact that they have to take control over their own, their own future. And their future is now, as an old Redskins coach used to say 25 years ago, the future is now uh, for them. The, the elections are coming up next year. You know, the, the, the theme of this panel, of the theme of the conference is, is uh, can Argentina survive Cristina? Uh, and and I, th I agree with uh, whoever said earlier that yes, the answer is yes. One of the reasons, I think, for optimism is that the institutions appear to be stronger than they looked, uh, certainly at the beginning of the, the Kirchner rule, the, and I say I mean, both Kirchners. Uh, for example, uh, the case was mentioned earlier of the vice president, the current vice president, of Argentina, I mean, this is an incredible case, uh, who was accused, accused by a federal judge, charged with uh, all kinds of crimes, bribery, et cetera, because when he was finance minister in 2010, he prevented the bankruptcy of a, of a private company, which he later managed to take over while he was still in government. He's being accused of taking over this, this government, having used government funds to prevent the bankruptcy of the company. This is this is, I hate to say it, but pretty typical. By the way, it's not typical just of Argentina. And I can, I can say this, maybe we're being too tough on Argentina. Uh, it happens to be the, the designated target for today. But the same things that we're describing in Argentina have happened in practically every, con in fact, every country in Latin America. Very sad. But going back to Argentina, the courts, the courts have brought that vice president to justice. That's very encouraging. The Congress has not given Christina everything it wanted. Some of the members of her own government are running, uh, well, her government or, or her husband's government are running against her. I think those are encouraging signs. Now, whether they will turn into a movement, I think it's, it's it, it, I don't know. Can I just offer a, a bit more optimistic counterpoint <clears throat> than autos. Um, I'm not Argentine. I'm also not a psychoanalyst, so I'm probably going out a little on a limb and trying to psychoanalyze Christina Fernandez de Kirchner. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's some people who say that uh, um, she, th there's no way that she will ever um, sort of change her view on the never negotiate with uh, holdout creditors. Um, we hear I've, I've heard people say that she's, she talks to her deceased husband sometimes and has this conversation, and he tells her never give in to the buitres, and uh, she promises, okay, Nestor, I'll never give in. But uh, there are others who believe that she's more pragmatic, um, and um, if one takes that view, um, I think, uh, you know, first of all, you can explain why um, up to, from, from late June until now, um, she and Axel Kisilov have taken a relatively intransigent posture, patria buitres, um, because she got a bump in the polls from doing that. But uh, <clears throat> now we're seeing, we're already seeing the serious economic consequences of the default. Um, inflation is getting even worse. Um, I, I'm not an economist, but I suspect that uh, it won't be long before we start seeing, as a consequence of this amendment to the law of supply, there's going to be even greater short shortages. Um, <clears throat> that's going to generate popular unrest. Um, summer's coming, um, and Argentina's desperately short on um, foreign currency, which it's going to need in order to uh, pay for natural gas and sort of in order to generate electricity. I think we may see um, energy shortages in this coming summer. Summer, and all of those things, um, I think it's pretty obvious, could. Uh, could amount to some pretty serious civil unrest. And um, if um, Christina is pragmatic, as I, I suspect at some level she must be, then it's not hard to imagine that we may see um, a change in her posture um, on renego or negotiating with holdout creditors um, before she leaves office. I hope so. I think one good test of how things are going to play out in the near future uh, has to do with uh, Citicorp, which 
has a very large branch in uh, Argentina and uh, basically uh, has been ordered by the uh, Kirchner regime under pain of, of a criminal prosecution and perhaps uh, uh, confiscation of the bank's assets to uh, forward payments that are to be made on September 30th uh, by the government uh, onto some of the uh, uh, exchange bondholders. Uh, most of the bonds are, are paid through a bank by the name of Bank New York Mellon, but there is a certain number of, uh, of, uh, of bonds that, that are covered by the injunction that, that go through uh, uh, Citicorp. If the uh, uh, administration in, in uh, Argentina wants to up the ante and takes serious action against uh, Citicorp, then I, I think that's a sign that they are not backing down. But at the same time, if you want to restore uh, confidence in world uh, financial markets in your stability, uh, expropriating uh, the assets of a large branch of one of the largest banks in the world is not the way to go about doing it. And uh, um, so I'm hopeful that Dennis is right, that there is room for compromise. And uh, if Argentina in the coming weeks backs down and does not take action against Citicorp, that's a sign of some compromise. However, when uh, Citicorp was in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit last week, uh, asking the court to please have mercy on it. They said there's a gun being pointed to our head by the Argentine government, and we're afraid it's going to go off in a week or two unless you you uh, give us some leeway here in New York. Uh, uh, that suggests that uh, Citicorp is afraid of what is to come. So we shall see fairly soon. I guess my two cents is I'm less optimistic. I truly thought for a year and a half that if they finally lost and were confronted with, you'll either have to default or cut a deal with the plaintiffs, they cut a deal. They didn't. I'm not so sure it's politics, but rather a true believer in the national myths. And if Christina thinks she's fighting a global battle of good versus evil. It may not be till it's next press and probably won't that any progress at all will be made despite the hardships and pain on the Argentine economy. At least that's where I've come out after the past six, seven weeks. Let me turn it over. We have 20 minutes and I'm sure, let's see if we can have 20 questions. Back there. <laughs> Uh, in loan documentations of the, in the private sector, the nature that uh, Argentina is faced with, there's always a clause in there that's called a drag-along clause, which is that if a number, for instance, of banks in a syndication, a certain percent agree to a modification, they can drag the agreed minority along with them. Uh, I have to assume there was none of that in this particular uh, loan documentation. No, the, the, the loan documents that govern what's called the holdout debt mm -hmm. <clears throat> allow for modification, less than unanimous modification, only for relatively uh, um, uh, ministerial things. I mean, certainly no, um, like, uh, you can't abrogate covenants, um, mm -hmm. reduce the amount of principal interest rate, any of those things without unanimous consent in the documentation that governs the holdout debt. Now, the restructured debt um, contains provisions that allow for cram downs, but not the holdout documentation. Gotcha. And I assume that uh, uh, the real issue here is that if they pay uh, the holdouts, then it triggers all the default clauses and all their other foreign debts, which well, is what makes it impossible for them to pay. They've already triggered all of those. They defaulted on their debt on June 30th. so. Uh, it's only at the forbearance of any of the exchange bondholders that they aren't themselves suing for the full principal at this point. Well, I hope we'll all be drinking Malbec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would just point out that any number of countries have restructured successfully with very high participations and no litigation 
what I'd call uh, legacy bonds, which don't have majority enforcement clauses in them. Uh, under New York law, they just weren't issued until uh, 19, uh, 2000. I think Mexico did first 2003, but maybe in 2004. So the lack of what you call a drag along has not historically been an impediment to getting well into the 90s and then cleaning up the holdout problem. say that one of the reasons that they have difficulties, and I don't understand much about the economics of it, is that till December, there is a clause in their contract of those uh, renegotiated bonds that if they give in to uh, dictates of the uh, buitres of the funds uh, that are wanting to, to be paid in full, all their debt will have to be paid in that same way. Is that correct, or is that uh, just an Argentinian fantasy? One of you guys want to take that I, one? You're probably better. Um, you're, you're referring to the rights under future offerings provision I, I, in, in, the, uh, in, in the exchange bonds. And the answer is no, that's not an impediment. That Yes, that is a pretext um, that was invented by uh, um, Kisilov and uh, Christina. Um, if you study the language of the provision carefully, and particularly if you go back and you look at the legislative history of the clause, it's absolutely clear that it was never meant to prohibit settlement with um, claimants, like holdout claimants. Um, all it was intended to deal with is a situation where Argentina um, reopens its exchange or offers it or, or, or issues a new exchange um, which <clears throat> happened in 2010. But um, if Argentina were to offer better terms in the new exchange, then they have to offer the same terms to anyone who participated in a prior exchange. That's all that the Rufo Clause was intended to do. And that expires in uh, three months. But the bondholders have signaled absolutely no interest in invoking it. Right. In fact, uh, a number of the bondholders have right, they've organized themselves um, to, to to offer to uh, initiate a consent solicitation process to eliminate the Rufo clause from the exchange bonds. But up to now, Argentina has shown no interest in um, in embracing that process. Um, obviously, because uh, um, it would eliminate one pretext for uh, for not negotiating with the holdouts. I have one other point. I have asked myself this question. It's so obvious that everybody thinks that we should be paying for the oil, that uh, it was a good thing that So why don't they do it? Uh, they have been established some, maybe they have some political uh, interest uh, that uh, Christina is, uh, increases her uh, popular uh, ag agreement. But I think that the explanation is different. And uh, referring to you not being Argentinian and not being a psychoanalyst, I happen to be both. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you answer the question. <laughs> so uh, I am not going to answer the question, but I am going to offer a, a theory. And my theory is that the Argentinians do believe that they are right. And in that sense, I have to agree with the chairman that this does not bode well. Since they feel that the right is theirs and that those that do not agree with them are part of an international, if not conspiracy, at least bad will to a country that has suffered a lot, that 
is whose inhabitants are of a very elevated uh, grade of human beings, it makes it very difficult for them, first, to look at the reality, second, to agree with principles that they do not obey, and uh, to uh, make restitution to what they have practically stolen. I just have a quick comment about that, which is that I think that the United States has a lot to answer for, for its treatment of Latin America over the last 200 years, and in part, that is the cause of, I think, of that attitude. I mean, certainly it was true in the past that if Americans were owed debt by Argentina, they didn't resort to courts, they sent gunboats down there, and, and uh, that probably has built up, built up a lot of resentment over the years. And I do think that uh, it is, uh, good that in recent years, first of all, the United States doesn't do that, and secondly, the United States has gone out of its way uh, when when the United States' interests are threatened in courts to respect court judgments, even if they don't necessarily agree with them. And I think a very good example of that is the recent judgment in the courts of Ecuador against Chevron Corporation for something like $16 billion dollars where there is a lot of evidence out there that, that, that the uh, judgment was totally the result of corruption, that the American attorneys uh, paid huge bribes to the judges to get those, uh, 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 that judgment entered. Yet the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, the very same one that is hearing the Argentinian case, ruled that despite all that evidence, that it w the American courts would not enter an injunction prohibiting the uh, plaintiffs from trying to collect their judgment around the world, that they are still free to try to collect their judgment anywhere. Now, of course, Chevron doesn't have any assets in Ecuador, so it will then be up to the plaintiffs to go to other countries uh, around the world and try to convince them that the judgment is fair and should be uh, respected. But, uh, but to the credit of the American courts, they have barred Chevron from trying to block the plaintiffs from even making those attempts in other countries. They are they're going to be permitted to try to collect. Let me just let me just defend the U.S. gunboat diplomacy here for a minute. Uh, <laughs> I love it. Uh, you know, I, I, having been ambassador to Venezuela, I recall that President Roosevelt sent U.S. naval ships to run the Europeans out of Venezuelan waters at the beginning of the last century when they were collecting debts. And the European powers had taken over uh, all Venezuelan ports and were, in effect, running the customs houses, houses, and that's how they were collecting the debts that were owed to them. So what does this tell us? First of all, that <laughs> failure to pay debts is nothing new in, uh, in this hemisphere, uh, that American gunboats, uh, I don't recall, uh, frankly, they may be, I may be wrong, I don't recall being sent to Argentina to collect debts. Paraguay, Paraguay okay, but not Argentina. Uh, uh, Okay, which is, by the way, going up the Plate River all the way to Paraguay is quite a feat in itself. They may have done it just for naval practice or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but, you know, the, the, uh, the, I have a question, frankly, along those lines. Why did the Obama administration side with Argentina in this case? Or am I wrong? I mean, didn't they, didn't they file an amicus? Yeah, they, I, it, it's a good question, although... Um, the Bush administration filed uh, an amicus brief in an earlier round of the litigation. Recall, this goes back to, the litigation goes back to My understanding. 2002. Um, so it's not just the Obama administration that supported Argentina in the litigation. Two factors at work, as I understand it, watching. One is, in State Department, I'm told that the legal advisor's office is extraordinarily sensitive to issues of sovereign immunity. What happens to them could happen to us, despite the fact we don't issue debt externally. And so State was very, very sensitive to anything involving an extension or an erosion of sovereign immunity. The Treasury, they simply got it wrong. The same bureaucrats as in the Bush administration, the same bureaucrats today, 
uh, simply are not experienced individually on sovereign debt restructuring and what produces 90, 95, 98 percent acceptance and what doesn't. And they genuinely thought and think that if holdouts win, it will undermine future restructurings, which more often than not, the holdouts do get paid in time and full, and it hasn't affected the next one. So they just got it wrong. But it's at the bureaucratic, not the political level, is what I keep hearing here. I, I mean, and what I've seen is that that's exactly true. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, um, in the latest, uh, in, in the most recent um, round of the litigation over Perry Passu, um, because the uh, situation has become so politically charged, we saw a little bit of attention paid to it um, from uh, from people at the political level, but uh, prior to then, I think it was all being dealt with at the at the bureaucrat level. Yeah, I have a question for the, there, someone I don't know, I forget his name, wrote in the Guardian some weeks ago something that gets repeated endlessly by the Argentines from President Kirchner on down that Obama can undo the uh, judge's decision with a stroke of the pen simply by writing, dear judge, can we say, your injunction is contrary to American foreign policy. I'd love for the panelists to answer that one because you hear it all the time in Argentina. It's Greg Pallast is the name of the... Um, the Ballast or Pallast? Pallast, and he's just wrong. I mean, he's just... I mean, he couldn't be more wrong. He has no idea what he's talking about. Um, I mean, I can explain, but uh, um, I don't think, I think most of the members of the audience would probably understand that uh, um, the president can't just write a letter to a court and say, decide a case this way um, and, 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 um, and with the, expect the court to roll over. It doesn't work that way here in the United States. I do think that the United States government does have a lot of influence at the U.S. Supreme Court. and. If the United States had weighed in heavily on the side of Argentina, it might have made a difference. And I think in this case, you saw over time the support that Argentina was receiving from the United States government waned somewhat. And their last brief that they filed in the Second Circuit said, well, we think the interpretation of the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act by Judge Grise may have been a little flaky. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, given the extreme incalcitrance of Argentina, maybe it really ought to lose this case after all. So that was kind of lukewarm support. And then they had two separate occasions when they could have filed amicus briefs in the U.S. Supreme Court, and on neither occasion they did, uh, did they? And, and I suspect that had they weighed in at that tertiary stage, uh, you might have seen the United States Supreme Court say, okay, we're not bound by what the U.S. government says, but at least we pay attention and we'll listen to the case. So, so I, I do think that uh, uh, the U.S. government's support was not uh, full for Argentina, and that lack of full support probably made a difference. Well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, first of all. So uh, I think whoever said that in the Guardian may have been confusing uh, the ability. I agree with you that the president can't do that, and the president should not do that. I mean, if the president even has the power to do it, I would implore the president never to do that, because then we might as well, you know, hang it up. We, we become another Argentina or Venezuela or Cuba, uh, you know, where the president, and I've seen this, picks up the phone and tells a judge how to rule in a case, you know, whether it's a uh, you know, a, a traffic ticket or bank robbery or whatever. Uh, that that's what the, the rule of law is. What differentiates the United States from well, from what differentiates developed countries from underdeveloped countries. And as long as some countries do this kind of you know intervention, whether it's a president or whoever it is, to violate the rule of law, they're going to remain underdeveloped. Um, that's my field of economic development. It's not, it's not the law. And, and uh, I, I firmly believe that it's the lack of rule of law that affects every aspect of national life. Um, and it's the biggest obstacle to economic development that I've seen in, in 35 years of, of working in Latin America in, in, in and out of that field. Um, 
there is something called the official secrets. So I have seen the Treasury Department, uh, I think it's Treasury, Justice maybe, but I've seen uh, Justice write a letter to a court and uh, invoke something like, is it called the Official Secrets Act, the National Security uh, something, uh, saying this particular case should not go forward because in order to, if you get to discovery, it could affect uh, the, national the national security of the United States. And that may be what they're talking about, what these, you know, I what they're no referring to. Talking. I don't know. Uh, I, 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 think I, I think I've heard of what you're talking about, although it's not my area, so uh, I don't. I don't know the ins and outs of it, yeah, but I, I the, one, the one thing that I, I would agree with you on, though, is that uh, it wouldn't apply to this circumstance at all. Uh, Greg Pallast was just wrong, but and it's not the first time Greg Pallast is usually yeah. wrong. Um, but uh, just like one interesting anecdote um, to expand on, um, um, Otto, your point about uh, the rule of law and the importance of an independent judiciary in, a, um, in civil society. Um, also in the Argentina litigation, many of you may have read about uh, um, how NML arrested the Argentine sailing frigate, the Fregata Libertad, in Ghanaian uh, waters in 2012, <clears throat> which actually I served the papers on the captain of that ship. It was an interesting <laughs> in, in, uh, experience. Um, but uh, um, to the judicial independence point, um, one of the many things that came out of that story that I found fascinating and really illuminating about the mentality of uh, the people who run Argentina is um, Argentina's response to um, the litigation in Ghana wasn't to present defenses in the Ghanaian litigation to try to argue to the Ghanaian court that the arrest order was issued in violation of international law and that the ship was entitled to what's called warship immunity and could never have been arrested and that Argentina couldn't waive that. Those are the arguments that they should have made in the Ghanaian court. I think they would have been wrong, but they sh should have made those arguments. They didn't do that. In fact, they didn't even appear in the Ghanaian court proceedings after maybe the first or second appearance. Instead, they went, they sent an ambassador directly to Ghana um, to bully or attempt to bully um, the uh, Ghanaian Minister of Foreign Affairs into telling the court to vacate the arrest order. But because Ghana has a very strong tradition of judicial independence, um, the Ghanaian Minister of Foreign Affairs wouldn't do that. Um, and, uh, but, 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 and, and the stories that I was hearing back from uh, um, people within the Ghanaian government who were sort of like involved in some of these discussions suggested to me that the, both the mentality of, well, of course the president can come in and tell the courts what to do. I mean, isn't it that way in every country? And also the arrogance of the um, Argentine diplomats sort of going to Ghana and saying, but you don't really know what you're dealing with. This is an important international matter. Just take our word for us and vacate their, tell the court to vacate the arrest order. Um, it, I think it's, it's highly indicative of sort of the mentality of the people who are, uh, who are running the country now. Uh, yes, let's see. Ladies first. Obviously, Argentina is not going to disappear from the geography of the world, but I do think that there's going to be a medium and long-term impact, a very significant one. We're already seeing that in the numbers over the last 40 years as, as income has gone down per capita income in comparison to its neighbors. And the reason I say this is for two reasons. One is specifically related to Argentina, and the other is related to emerging markets. With respect to Argentina, I mean, one could look at the situation of Peru and Alan Garcia in the first administration, which I was involved in just as much as I was involved in some of the Argentine crises. And um, later, the World Bank and everyone out of, the way, out of the way to help Peru solve its problem. But that was sort of a one-off with Peru. Argentina shows up with the bearing crisis in 1850 and every five to seven years after that. So people have had a long history of problems with Argentina. And the second thing is that now, when the 1982 debt crisis happened, the Colombians were very upset because they had a very good credit rating, but nobody paid any attention because Latin America was just put in the... But now, as emerging markets have become a lot more sophisticated, both for financial institutions and, and um, the private sector, I really think that Argentina is going to pay the price 
over the next 20 years with respect to its access to capital markets? Uh, so you had a question? Or a comment, either one, go ahead. Well, I think that um, it's been quite clear that um, the consensus is that uh, the Argentine government is, uh, is wrong and the bondholders have rights. They may be a little stubborn, but they have rights. What about the exchange bondholders' rights? Um, I think you've glossed over that. And um, when they made the exchange, did they not uh, protect themselves from this kind of uh, consequence? What are their rights? Uh, in the exchange offer of 2005, in the risks section written by Argentina, it very explicitly warns the risk that exactly this could happen. Okay? Second, you got to remember, there was no negotiations. These people had a gun to their heads and either it was move on or spend 10 years. And Argentina was passing laws prohibiting themselves from ever dealing with a holdout again. It's this or the train is lost. So that's sort of the factual situation. Yes, they always knew there was a risk. And to say they didn't now is baloney. These are sophisticated funds. They, I'm sure they read that part of it. The, the other thing is every time there's even the remotest hint of Argentina's willingness to negotiate and reach a settlement, what happens to the bond, the exchange bonds? They shoot up in value. The market, the exchange bondholders vote every single day on what they want to see happen. And that's very clear. They want to see this case settled. The exchange bondholders certainly have plenty of rights to be paid just as much as everybody else. And uh, Argentina was the party that chose to pay nobody rather than to pay everybody. That's all the courts did was to give them a choice of, of either shafting everybody or paying everybody. They couldn't just pay some of the people. Furthermore, over the last nine years, exchange bondholders haven't gotten a lot of repayment of their bonds, but they've got some money. The holdout bondholders have gotten zero. So I, I'm sympathetic with the plight of exchange bondholders, but I'm also probably more sympathetic to the rights of those who have received nothing on their bonds. One more, or we should we call it a day and, and head off? A little bit Tom. Past the one last comment. Argentina is at the end of the world. It is isolated. All flights stop in Argentina. Nothing goes through. <laughs> well, thank you, That's panelists. That's what the Pope said. The Pope said, I come from the end of the world. Remember he said that when he... Uh... <laughs> thank you, panelists. Uh, I'm sure the audience agrees with me. You guys did a great job. And thank